time for us to transition from covering politics to talking about the monument mythos. Ooh, hell yeah, 10 letter name. So for those of you who don't know, the monument mythos is essentially a alternate world conspiracy theory about a world where the monuments of America conceal dark secrets. And I've watched the first season of it. And, um, it's weird. And we tried to start it the other day, but, um, that didn't, uh, that didn't fly too well with me playing a video game. Aw, Public Loser. I can toss a coin to my streamer. Public Loser, thank you for the $10 dono. I very, very much appreciate that. Um, but it's fun and interesting and deeply weird and maybe a bit disturbing. But we're going to take a look at uh, the Monument Mythos. This has been something that has been made over the last few years by a YouTuber who goes by Mr. Manticore. There are actually several seasons of it now. I've watched the first season, and I am fascinated by it. And I remember that uh, one, of the, uh, one, one of our community members, I think Archangel the Cobb, uh, sent me a link to this a while back. And I did not know what it was or what to make of it. But now that I have like some additional context, um, it's very cool. So we're going to start from the beginning. We're going to start from the beginning, okay? And we're going to watch it together. And see what we can figure out. There are... Is it legit or creepypasta? I don't know what that means in the context of this. It's, it is an alternate world from our own that has a somewhat similar history, but also very, very different. And there are definitely very weird supernatural Lovecraftian elements to it. Um, and I've watched the first season. I know that there are three seasons right now, and I think of, there might even be four seasons. I'm, I'm not entirely sure how to term it all together. But it all builds on itself. Specifically, was the Statue of Liberty thing real? No. As far as I know, no. The Statue of Liberty is not, uh, it was not created on a series of gears to let it open. Um, so, no. But this series has a lot of details in it that are uh, unnerving in a very similar way. So let's watch it together and figure out and try and figure out what's happening, okay? Actually, I'm going to move this to a different tab because that seems to make the uh that seems to make the YouTube player happy. It's not anti-Semitic. I watched the first season. Okay, and we watched this uh, yesterday, but for people who weren't here yesterday, we'll watch it again. In 2011, Riley Tillen uploaded three videos describing an unseen presence in his home. A fourth video in 2013 raised concerns over his safety and prompted an official investigation. Upload 1, 10-2011. Many dimensions intersect with their own several of which are 2D planes. When two or more planes intersect, they form corners. Entities in the intersecting planes cannot perceive each other. They exist separately, in their own worlds. However, the corner folk can pass these boundaries and enter other planes. The corner folk are a trans-dimensional species. They are the only ones who can traverse the corners shaped by planes. Coincidentally, I believe that the corners of my own home align with several planes for I have seen the corner folk in action, 
crossing the corners from one reality to another. While making this video, I heard the corner folk and immediately got my camera. This is what I recorded. Analysis. This leap requires massive amounts of energy that, when released, produces bright blue flashes. I have yet to discover the source of this energy, and the reason behind the cornerful crossings remains unknown. Upload 2, 10, 27, 11. So, seven days later? While I was at work, my cameras captured up to 12 corner folk huddling in the doorway. I used to think that they had to cross dimensions quickly, but the new footage has proven otherwise. When I'm not around, they take a break from traveling and exhibit micro-movements similar to dreaming animals. Oh God, they're, they must they're feel like safe jittering. in these corners, which suggests that the corner folk's own home is made of similar structures. I imagine that their corner world is made of many plane intersections, allowing them to move freely without using up any energy. My photographs show that smaller corner folk have odd impressions on their skin, as though they had been pressed against many plane intersections at once. The corners likely belong to a nursery or a crib in their home world. A multitude of corners placed in close proximity could be used to secure the infant from leaving the corner world. Perhaps they only cross corners in search of food, the same way we only leave our homes for resources. The corner world may be used to raise young, while my own house's corners serve as rest stops of sorts during their journeys. Upload 3, 12, 16, 11. So like two months later? I've begun to dream of the corner world. I can't stop thinking about it. According to the calendar, I've spent entire weeks in my home. Just drawing and describing the corner world on paper. I lost my job last month due to repeated absences. But it really does feel like I just left the office this afternoon. Tindalos Corners. When the corner folk jump, it feels as though they're taunting me. But I'm close to a solution. Yo, get out of that Regardless house, Regardless of whether my body survives the forces of the corner world or not, this much is certain. The fear of my own destruction will not prevent my entry. Upload 4010313. So two years later. Following his last upload, viewers requested a wellness check on Riley Tillin. Local authorities found Tillin asleep in one corner of his room. A closer examination revealed that his internal organs had been folded along various axes, warranting immediate medical attention. During his recovery, Tillin avidly made origami despite claiming to never have been taught how to do so. As of 2020, he remains in the care of his friends. Endless corners. Corners everywhere. A lot of these are what? They will start making sense, sort of. The following audio is an excerpt. Sorry. Excerpt from an 1889 interview with the designer of the Statue of Liberty. The most difficult aspect of the construction was the pedestal. Although the statue was intended to be a gift, the U.S. ambassador urged us to follow President Grant's requests. 
We agreed, and each month we received varying size requirements for the pedestal. After four years, requests to change the size of the pedestal ceased. People wonder why the pedestal is so much taller than the lady. All they tell them is, ask the Americans. In 1949, the statue underwent extensive renovations. The official blueprint behind the changes, titled STLI 1.8084, provide entrance for sustenance, install engine to assist with <laughs> arrival departure. There's an engine. There is an axle, supposedly to turn or open something, wheels. have an entrance and stairs and a drain and then a waste storage chamber. Hey, Shaloon. During the summer of 1954, thousands of immigrants described the foul odor while passing through Ellis Island. And the island Ellis Island was awful. The whole place reeked of flesh, like a slaughterhouse. There were also dead birds everywhere. My sister even found one in the toilet. If this is how the coast is, my father said, imagine how bad the city smell. I remember hearing other families half-jokingly say they wanted to return to Milan because of the smell. My family had sprayed perfume and burned candles to keep the stench away, but it would only work for an hour or so until the air became unbearable. The evenings were so hot, I stayed mostly awake even though the rest of my family slept soundly. I remember looking out the window each night and seeing lines of people being led to the Liberty Statue by officials. After they would go to the pedestal, into the pedestal, the officials would leave, and nothing else would happen. The following morning would smell so much worse, though, like a slaughterhouse. None of this is real, Gamergy. The Ellis Island Immigration Station closed the following November. August 1985, first sighting of the Liberty Lurker. Upon investigation, local authorities likened the waste storage compartment to a mass grave. If you have family members who were last seen at Ellis Island between the years 1949 and 1954, you may be entitled to compensation. Okay, so... Can we get a look at what came out? There's like... It's like a giant hand. Not entirely sure what these are, but they did come out. Yeah. Not sure what that is. Um, and uh, when they looked at waste storage, it was a mass grave or they likened it to a mass grave, which seems to me indicate that this drain was draining something into that storage container. Let's, uh, let's move along. Next one is Rushmore Revenge. August 7th, 2003. The National Park Service finds the Mount Rushmore National Memorial vandalized. It says, The U.S. government can fund mass murder if it's labeled a national monument. I think extrajudicial execution? of over 2,600 American uh, landmarks or acts. 
The souls of Lincoln will be freed. The blood of the... The blood of liberty will be avenged? I think? Oh, it's gonna zoom in. Okay. Well, oh, okay. Well, okay. Okay, video. All right. Every day, executions occur in 2,600 American landmarks. The blood of liberty will be avenged. The souls of Lincoln will be freed. Okay. August 14th, 2003. More messages are found on Mount Rushmore. I will introduce infection next week, Monday through Sunday, 12, uh, 10, 12 to 10, 13 p.m. Watch for symptoms. August 18th, 2003. Due to national security concerns, the National Park Service assigns patrols for the next seven nights. Patrols are told to videotape all anomalies from 10, 12 to 10, 13 p.m. Monday. When is this? This is 2003. Got some flashing light up there. Ah, uh, this is 2003, Astral Storm. It feels so weird to watch over again. Rushmore smells just like baby powder nowadays. I think it comes from the stuff that the workers put on the heads. Yeah, I see them do it all the time. They go from Washington to Lincoln every night, powdering it like a baby. Hannah McElroy, local photographer. Huh. I'm just gonna back up and... Seems bad. I, I I don't I don't think I don't think this seems okay. It looks like the heads are moved up. All right. Okay. Alcatraz attacks.
Alcatraz Island two days before therapy. Map of the Pacific Branch, United States Military Prison, Alcatraz Island. We have the fortifications. The tunnel. Reservoirs. The water tower. All the modern conveniences. The board. The stockade yard. The detector shed. For all your detecting needs, here's the main prison. I don't know what that is. Don't look in there. The tennis courts. And whatever the fuck that is. Alcatraz Island, one day before therapy. Alcatrazosis. So, people are in the prison. And it become it begins dividing. Okay. Alcatraz Island, radiation therapy number one. Project movement, projected movement. 1950, 1955. 2020, the Alcatraz Zone extends to West Texas. Um, I, I don't, I don't think their projected uh, movement of Alcatraz was accurate, guys. I think, I think, I think, uh, since it extends to West Texas by 2020, uh, I think, uh, I think Alcatrazosis is spreading far faster than anticipated. So it's a bacteria. That's kind of what it seems like, xenomonic. Uh, that is kind of what it seems like, explains DeSantis. <laughs> Dean Democracy. Look back, at, look back at America's 37th president. During a program of ABC Evening News, anchor Peter Jennings told viewers to look forward to next week for a special broadcast of national significance. Jennings would continue to remind viewers of the special broadcast over the next seven nights, even referring to it at one point as the most unprecedented announcement in recent history. A week after its first mention, Jennings reminded viewers of the special broadcast one last time, 
asking them to pay attention later that night for an exclusive look at the greatest gift to the American people. Due to the anticipation build over the week, over 60 million Americans tuned into ABC, waiting for the evening news to end and for the special broadcast to begin. There were countless theories as to what would occur, from the announcement of alien life to the declaration of an all-out nuclear war. Speculation was brewing intensely. Once the evening news program ended, a black screen with a 10-second countdown commenced with the title Dean Democracy. Some viewers, so terrified of the threat of nuclear war, reportedly experienced nervous breakdowns and ran down the street declaring that Dean Democracy was the code name for an all-out nuclear holocaust. Yet once the countdown ended, all fears were soon replaced with tears of joy and an excitement not seen since the end of World War II. What are we waiting for? Let's bring them back home! In the seconds following James Dean's presidential announcement, hundreds of thousands of neighborhoods erupted into celebration. Although other candidates had promised to end the Vietnam War, none had so accurately expressed the same anger that they had felt, which Dean had perfectly conveyed in a 15-second broadcast. Due to popular demand, the ABC Evening News was cancelled the next night replaced by a 30-minute loop of James Dean's presidential announcement. The broadcast was watched again by over 38 million Americans, and the parties continued for the rest of the week. Is it, no, it's James Dean! It's J James Dean! Due to repeated assassination attempts on Robert Kennedy, the Democratic Party presidential debates were cancelled for the 1968 election season. However, this proved to be no issue for Dean, as polls indicated that he was in the lead for the entirety of 1967 and 1968, despite having had fewer public appearances and rallies than any other candidate. The strength of his campaign relied on the powerful advertisements he directed that would air every Friday evening on ABC. The series of programs would be considered by many as another weekly TV series and went on to become the highest rated TV show on television after the <laughs> conclusion of Star Trek in 1967. Although a presidential debate was eventually scheduled two weeks before the election, James Dean instead invited opponent Richard Nixon to a track to race cars on the same night. Although reluctant at first, Nixon eventually agreed and went to spend the entire day with Dean, reportedly even telling the actor, to hell with it, I'm voting for you. You're already a better president than I'll ever be. <laughs> this statement, although only a rumor, would spread like wildfire in tabloids and permanently curbed Nixon's chance for victory. Is this real? No. On the morning no, of November 1st, No, it's not. It's about how James Dean and Richard Nixon became really good friends and James Dean was the most popular guy. And all he did was show up on television for 15 seconds to announce that he's running for president. 68. <laughs> four days before election day, anti-Dean groups hijacked radio channels and told civilians they were fed up with James Dean and that television was ruining American youth. After the broadcast, the groups went on to cut hundreds of power lines in the southeast, effectively preventing any of Dean's presidential ads from reaching any household below Tennessee. Dean quickly heard of the incident and despite the risk of an assassination, flew down to the south and quickly went to work with local electricians to repair the broken power lines. James Dean would be met with a supportive crowd, primarily younger voters who were eager to see a younger face back in the White House. Elderly white conservatives, often the parents of the younger supporters, remained in their houses and occasionally peered through <laughs> their window blinds to catch a glimpse of the handsome candidate. Although it wasn't known to Dean at the time, Hate groups in the South had perpetuated the idea that he was Satan in disguise, and cited his good looks and his love for jazz as being clear signs of the devil. <laughs> James Dean is no man. By the Anti Dean Association. Elderly white conservatives in the Southeast would be the only demographic unfazed by his campaign, yet, Dean continued to travel from state to state, repairing power lines for four days straight until the very morning of the election. On November 5, 1968, 
James Dean received 75% of the popular vote, with 395 electoral votes. <laughs> Nixon congratulated Dean in a phone call the following morning, <laughs> but Dean refused to acknowledge the win and instead asked to race cars again at the track. <laughs> On January 20th, 1969, James Dean held his inaugural address at the official Capitol Raceway. Although presidents in the past had speeches that were typically around 20 minutes, Dean spoke for less than a minute. I have a speech, and it has the thoughts and that you people expect to hear. But that's not fair. No, that's not fair at all. I'm here for all of you. It's only fair that you speak for yourselves. My words shouldn't be louder than yours. So I've brought many other guests to speak. They're just people like you and I. In the same time that many other presidents have spoken by themselves, America will speak. Thank you. His voice sounds really weird, right? Like, just can, like, right? Guests to speak. They're just people like you and I. In the same time that many other presidents have spoken by themselves, America will speak. Thank you. Dissonant AI. Dean Everyone spoke like that in the 60s. Many okay. groups to the microphone, including civil rights activists and Native American families. Martin Luther King Jr. would also come forward to speak in his first appearance since an attempt on his life nine months prior. President Dean would conclude the inauguration with a brief bongo performance <laughs> and went on to race Richard Nixon at the track. In subsequent presidential inaugurations, those who disagreed with the elected president would instead celebrate Dean Democracy Day and protested by watching Dean's unique take on the address in place of the actual one. In a televised address, President Dean planned to inform Americans of his first 90 days in office. However, six seconds into the broadcast, the audio cut out and remained absent for the remainder of the speech. Although anti-Dean groups claimed responsibility and took pride in the sabotage, many civilians claimed that it benefited the president. The silent broadcast highlighted President Dean's sincere facial expressions and lively disposition, as opposed to the stern and stiff personalities of prior administrations. Viewers were proud to see a man in his prime at the most important position in the country. Ironically, President Dean's popularity grew after the technical difficulty, and film director Stanley Kubrick went on to call the broadcast the greatest silent film ever made. <laughs> I've known where this is going for like 10 minutes because, well, yeah, I know history. Do you, though? Because I'm pretty sure that they just talked about Martin Luther King Jr. surviving the assassination attempt on his life. Not saying that you don't know history. That sounded really mean. I'm sorry. The Air Force One Angel. August 17th. 2003, Air Force One made an unannounced trip across the continental United States. Many civilians claim to have seen the aircraft drop packages on various national monuments. Wait a minute, I didn't notice this the first time I watched it. Uh, 
So, flying down to California here. Um, why, why is the border of California disappearing? Oh god. Oh wait. Oh wait, is it is it the fucking is it Alcatrazosis? I think it's Alcatrazosis chat. Cuz it ex it extend the border is extended to West Texas. Yeah, okay. Statue of Liberty. Okay, so we have Alcatrazosis, and then something's happening at Mount Rushmore, clearly, and then something's happening at the Statue of Liberty. Uh, things don't look good for America. <laughs> Was the Statue of Liberty gone in that photo? I don't think so. Never mind. Yes, the Statue of Liberty does not appear to be present in this photo. Uh li li Liberty's Liberty's gone. Uh Lady Starfire, thank you for subscribing over on Twitch. Order of the entire mountain west was gone? You mean here in this picture or are you oh you were talking right here. Yeah. We don't know what happened, Shalud. Maybe it's destruction or maybe it's something else. The fuck is that? The fuck is that? White House officials later disclosed that the unusual flight of Air Force One was unauthorized and unmanned. The lone figure seen inside the plane dubbed the Air Force One Angel has yet to be identified by federal authorities. Yeah, there are there are creatures in this. Those are in this monument mythos. The Lincoln Looker. Maya Arnold. There was a Lincoln Looker for two weeks. It was terrifying. One moment you're at home answering the door, and the next you're stuck in some kind of suit. The smell was awful in there, and the metal seat was so, so cold. The only thing you can do is look through two little holes. It was some kind of mask, and whenever the sun shined near, I could see the inside of it. It was a familiar face. Every few nights, straws would be put through the holes, and someone would feed me some weird soup. After two weeks, they found out that they had misidentified me, and I wasn't the correct Lincoln looker. Reagan apologized to me personally, and I was released with some monetary compensation. They don't care if I talk about it or not. No one would take me seriously. Lincoln looking is just too absurd. The 
mask drawn by Maya Arnoldson. Well, that just looks like Abraham Lincoln. There's always that someone that we dislike more than everyone else. Not usually famous. Leonard so far, W. Moreland. You've done something that's affected us personally. Often you're the, you know, the only person who remembers this act. But I've been that bad, but memory hurts. Everyone experiences this, and the president is no exception. Except he can do something about it. Every president can choose one person to be a Lincoln looker. After the alibi is fabricated, the person is abducted from their home, and they stay a Lincoln looker for as long as the president sits in office. Nobody can question his decision, and it's no trial. You might be surprised, Extra but judicial Lincoln new. looking. It's my tradition. Lincoln lookers have been around for a very long time. Uh. Wait. Oh, shit. Uh, due to rumors that Lincoln lookers were imprisoned behind presidential portraits, White House officials publicly removed and reinstalled the portraits to demonstrate that no space existed to hold Lincoln lookers. Howard Melrose. Hello, we are not available now. Please leave your name and phone number after the beep. We will return your call. Hey, Eunice. It's Howard. I don't know what I just saw. I was at the top of the steps, reading the inscriptions and talking to visitors, when I started to hear a faint scratching sound. I didn't think much of it at first, but when I got close to the chair, I realized that the scratching was coming from inside the marble. So I went to a guard and asked whether she could do anything about animals that could be trapped in there. She told me not to worry about it and that they'd take care of it once there were fewer visitors. A few minutes passed and the scratching became much louder. I went back to the guard and asked what kind of animals usually got stuck in there and she said, wild animals. The sound started to make visitors anxious. I remember one boy is pulling so hard at his mother's hand, begging to leave. A blind girl with one of those canes went up to the chair and pressed her head against it to listen. Then she started crying. Her parents tried to pull her away, but she just began to hit the chair with her cane. That's when the guards asked everyone to go back down the steps. I don't know why, and it's going to sound crazy, but I felt compelled to help. So I went to the blind girl and joined her in hitting the marble. The guards tried to pin us down, but the scratching became too loud for even them. It sounded like someone was shaving down a chalkboard. Eventually, the marble began to crack, and a few more hits caused the crevice to expand all the way to the top of the chair. There was a sudden burst of air from the damage, and the head suddenly turned toward us. I was afraid it would fall, so I picked the girl up and went down a few steps. The head slowly rotated back into place, and when it started to be pushed upwards, I took out my camera. There was no wild animal. Uh, Howard Melrose recorded the following images. are left here in the first season oh okay we're on okay yeah we're on the washington wormhole so we have one two three four four episodes left here this 
special treat. I remember this one. Swiftly. This was the first, I think one of the first ones I ever saw of this. And I was, I had no idea what was happening. I think it helps to contextualize a lot of the other stuff we've seen so far. I, this, this is now like my third or fourth time watching this particular one. So just pay attention to what's in here, okay? As the lumberjack swung, except for the special tree, which could not be stung, she missed her friends and the hymns they sung. So she started a tune that broke the man's lung. photograph of the special tree is taken. Eighteen forty eight. Construction begins. Eighteen sixty one to eighteen sixty five. Construction halts due to the American Civil War. Prisoners of war are seen being led into the unfinished tower. 1888, and that that construction is completed. That is the Washington Monument, folks. Visit the Washington Monument and listen closely. Hear the music within its walls. Ten cents per head. The Washington Monument becomes a major tourist attraction. That's 1910. 1910 to 1971. From 1910 to 1971, 20 individuals disappear while visiting the Washington Monument. The missing vi visitors are known as the Washington Absentees. Washington Standard Operation, 1972. A classified film titled Washington Standard Operation is leaked by news agencies. I would watch that movie in a heartbeat, Gamer G. The Washington Monument is also vandalized. Okay, so now we have a couple different monuments being vandalized. The infection is nigh. The music of Washington will end. Where is the special tree? That's a good question. We don't see the special tree there. 2003. Because it was built around the special tree, right?
Well, I, I, I guess it's still in there. Maybe whatever the fuck that was. All 19 Washington absentee absentees are found unconscious at the base of the monument. But there were 20 Washington. There were 20. Yeah. So it said there were 20 of them. Delaware River Journal. Delaware River, USA. That's been a discovery made by two fishermen and sent shockwaves across the nation. Around 4 p.m. on Christmas Eve, Ralph Grassman and Michael Tillen were really in the last batch of catfish. Wait. Michael Tillen. The, the guy in the corner folk was named Tillin, right? The guy in, the, like, one of the very first videos? The, the guy who was obsessed with corner folk? His, la his last name was Tillin, right? Am I, am I, am I on crazy pills chat? That sounds right. Yeah, I think I think so. Okay. On Christmas Eve, Ralph Grassman and Michael Tillen were really in the last batch of catfish when something on the ice caught their eye. It looked like a bicorn, one of those types from way back when, said Grassman. The rest of the two who also organized the trip. Grassman walked down the ice to retrieve the hat. When he pulled back the hat from the ice, someone back in shock at the sight of a human scout yeah, Riley exposed in the light. Tillin walked over and after a brief discussion with Grassman, agreed to remove the rest of the body from the ice. The effort took several hours, but by 10 p.m. the fishermen were able to pull the entire body from the ice with no further damage. Although both men had presumed that the individual was already dead for some time, Tillin exclaimed in shock when he reportedly saw the individual's eyelids twitch. Grassman suggests to immediately take the body home and attempt to revive the frozen man. They proceed to carry it back to Grassman's apartment. They laid the body in a full bathtub, gradually raising the water's temperature throughout the night to prevent shock. Grassman claims to have learned this technique from a pulp magazine he had read as a child. At 2 a.m. the following morning, Tony claimed that an individual briefly regained consciousness and shouted, Victory or death, while Grassman rested in the living room. At 7 a.m., the frozen individual appeared to have relapsed into a deep coma, which prompted Grassman to phone the local authorities. And that's why he hadn't called a medical personnel earlier. Grassman told reporters that he didn't want to risk the lives of the first responders, who had been driving on slippery roads in the dark. Shortly after being phoned, paramedics arrived and rushed the frozen man to the Delaware State Hospital. Throughout the experience, both fishermen thought that the individual's face seemed vaguely familiar. It was only when Tillman pulled out a dollar bill that the connection was fully made. When we first dug him out, we moved his clothes so we could carry him more easily. Clothes weighed a ton because they were completely frozen over. By day, if we saw the clothes without ice, then we could have no doubt that we dug out George Washington. Although yo, Delaware what? State Hospital has declined to comment hey, on the yo. identity and the condition of the man, Gressman brought the bicorn hat from the previous day to the Delaware History Museum, where historians can come to be an authentic piece from the 18th century. The validation raised more questions than answers, as further research revealed that no Washington reenactors or artifacts have been reported missing. Grassman believes that the man he dug out from the ice is the true George Washington, and that the former president had become gravely ill while crossing the Delaware River. Grassman claims that the imminent death of Washington could have been devastating to the war effort, though his condition was likely kept secret by having a double acting as the president until 1797 and asked for an explanation to why the body had been found so far from the site of the battle, Grassman replied, he either drifted away or his men purposely planted it far away so that no one could find it. During Saturday's morning press conference, President Dean shared his thoughts on the discovery in two words. I'm surprised. <laughs> James Dean is just... Excellent. Delaware River Journal. <laughs> Delaware River Journal ceased operations in 1976. Like, right after that story came out. Oh, chat? 
This one is also very important. So pay attention to this one. Uh, this one, this one's the one of the big ones. It's 18 minutes long, so it's it's a bit of a it's a bit of a doozy. But uh, pay attention to this one. Rockefeller Tree Tragedy. A Recollection of the Tragedy by John D. Rockefeller, 1937, and Virginia in Wonderland by Virginia. During the first winter of the center's construction, the workers set up a Christmas tree just outside the entrance. It was an uncanny sight to see a green fir stand in the middle of what appeared to be a no man's land. But this tree, humbly ordained with strings of cranberries, buttons, and tin cans, greatly affected me. It demonstrated that even in the darkest of times, the American people will light the beacons of hope. I thought it could be the start of a great and inspiring tradition, so I traveled north to Babylon in search of a Christmas tree for the following year. Is Babylon a place in New York? Yes, it is. Okay. It's on Long Island. For 12 days and 12 nights, Mr. Rockefeller looked for the best tree in the forest. How about this one, Mr. Rockefeller? No, no, it's much too short. How about this one, Mr. Rockefeller? No, no, it's much too tall. How about this one, Mr. Rockefeller? No, no, it's much too average. Mr. Rockefeller soon feared that he would leave empty-handed. Then, on the twelfth night, just as he was packing up his stuff, Mr. Rockefeller heard the sweetest tune in the air. It sounded as though the very wind itself had fallen in love. He and his men followed the song and found themselves at the base of a very, very special tree. How about this one, Mr. Rockefeller? A very special it's tree. perfect. For the rest of the night, the men swung their axes at the special tree. Chop, chop, chop. However, when the sun rose, the tree was still standing. Their axes had left no marks at all. Mr. Rockefeller was surprised. The next day, Mr. Rockefeller and his men laid 100 sticks of dynamite around the tree. Three, two, one, boom! Yet, the special tree continued to stand. Mr. Rockefeller was surprised. So Mr. Rockefeller decided to hire the best team of grave diggers to take the tree out of the ground. After a week of digging, they told Mr. Rockefeller, the tree will be out in three years at this rate. Mr. Rockefeller was surprised, but he decided to let the grave diggers work. He would take the next three best trees for the next three Christmases. But by the fourth year, the special tree was ready to display. Yeah. For the last two years, I have seldom mentioned the tragedy that occurred at the center. Many have taken offense at my silence claiming it to be the result of a desensitization to workplace accidents. Oh, no. Indeed, I have seen enough accidents in three lifetimes, but nothing could have prepared me for what happened at the center. For some time now, my friends have blamed the center's original construction workers for the tragedy since it was their very own Christmas tree that had started the whole tradition. But the truth is that their tree brought joy and wonder to the public. It was my tree, and my tree alone, 
have brought about the unprecedented loss. Watching the monument mythos, Metal Kitty Mom. On a cold December morning in midtown Manhattan, Rockefeller's men slowly raised the special tree. Heave ho! Heave ho! Heave ho! By the afternoon, the special tree stood tall and still. It was unlike any other tree, having no color, branches, or leaves. The Wait. No color. Did I miss Voosh being wrong? Yeah, uh, he, uh, he he's wrong about electric planes. Anyway, um, the true story of the giving tree? Kinda, yeah. The mayor of New York, Mr. Guardia, thought that the tree was too bare and asked for branches to be added so that ornaments could be hung. Mr. Rockefeller didn't agree. He thought the tree was perfect, just the way it was. But since Mayor Guardia had been one of his best friends, Mr. Rockefeller told his men to glue some branches on. I, Virginia, watched as the men placed branches on the special tree. I had saved my money for over nine months to purchase a little star ornament because I wanted to be the very first person to decorate the Rockefeller Christmas tree. It laid in my pocket while I watched because I planned to hang my ornament as soon as the tree was standing. Yeah, the tree is... I, I don't know this for sure, chat. I think the trees might be evil. Maybe. I I don't I don't know. But uh just throwing it out there, they might be evil. The men left. I quickly ran up to the tree. But to my astonishment, the lowest branch of the tree was over twice my height. I jumped as high as I could, but still the lowest branch was out of my reach. I was very disappointed. I wanted to be the very first person to decorate the tree, but now I had no chance. Unless, unless I called my friends. At once, I began counting my friends on my fingers. There was Helen, Charles, Elizabeth, Alice, Joseph, Elsie, Orville, Edith, Olive and Philip. Ten! Ten friends that I could ask for help. Then I realized that ten friends standing on each other's shoulders could put me at the very top of the Christmas tree. My star should be the first and the tallest. Without a second to spare, I ran from door to door asking for help. Knock, knock, knock. Helen, are you there? Knock, knock, knock. Charles, are you there? Knock, knock, knock. Elizabeth, are you there? Eventually, I gathered all ten of my friends at the bottom of the Rockefeller Christmas tree. I told them my plan, to have them all stand on each other and form a ladder for me to climb to the top. My friends understood my excitement, and they quickly started to climb onto each other's shoulders. Ow! Helen had stepped on Charles' fingers. Ow! Charles had stepped on Elizabeth's fingers. Ow! Elizabeth had stepped on Alice's fingers. After many groans and tumbles, my friends formed a sturdy ladder, and I began to climb. My joy grew with every passing face, and before I knew it, I was at the very top, looking down at the tree. My ladder of friends swayed back and forth, and occasionally felt like it was about to collapse. But I tuned out the movement and focused on the tree. Closer, friends, closer! Then I secured the metal star at the top of the tree. It was perfect. Hooray! Victory! I'm the first! Just then, there was a strange sound. The tree began to shake. Its glued branches fell off all at once, and the entire tree slowly bent backwards. Soon, the very top of it touched the ground, forming a perfect arc. It was like a very strange rainbow. My heart sank as I saw my star gently slide to the ground from the tree's top. Bolts of lightning then shot out from inside the arc of the tree, producing thunderous booms. The lightning scared my friends and me. We all tumbled to the ground and ran in all directions, but the lightning caught up to us. 
I was blinded by a great white light. I remember when my eyes adjusted, I was in a field of special trees, and, and I saw... Uh, and I saw so many people. One man ran up to me and whispered, the trees are not trees. In a flash, I returned to the street where my friends and I had been struck by the lightning. We were all on the ground, being attended to by other people. I had scratched my legs badly, and I could see that my friends were also hurt. I looked up at the Rockefeller building, and I thought that they looked a little different. The whole street looked a little different, and the special tree was nowhere in sight. That man is not a tree, he's a fake tree. It is only natural for the reader at this point to wonder why the incident has been referred to as a tragedy. There had been no loss of life and Aside from a few temporary scorch marks on the center, no damage to the surrounding property. I too assumed it was a mostly inconsequential event, likely an electrical accident whose effects were exaggerated by the children at the scene. I was grateful that every life involved had been spared. A death at the center would have weighed heavily on my mind for some time. But when I encountered the results of the children's medical examinations, I wished that a death had occurred in place of the unfathomable. but they looked completely different. Ma looked worried. After she wiped her tears, she asked, Did you hang your bear at the Rockefeller tree? I answered, It wasn't a bear. I was going to hang a star. To which they asked, What do you mean? Pa asked, Where did you get these clothes? I answered, These are my clothes, the ones you helped me put on this morning. To which they asked, what do you mean? My ma then asked, Why are there dots all over your face? I answered, Those are my freckles. I've had them since I was little. To which they asked, What do you mean? My parents quietly left my bed and talked to my friend's parents. Then they all started to cry and yell. The nurses made them leave, which made me feel better. None of us thought that our real parents had visited, but they all did feel familiar. Orville and Philip were especially shaken. They didn't even share the same last name with their parents. The nurses tried to convince us that those who had visited us were our parents, and that we would come around to properly greet them after we healed. But it was hard to believe. Whenever I looked out the window, I saw that Manhattan looked different from memory. Mr. Rockefeller himself was kind enough to visit us in the hospital. He asked us whether we were okay, and then after some time, he and the nurses began to ask us some very easy questions about American history. With every reply, they would chuckle and shake their heads, until I told Mr. Rockefeller who I thought he was. He chuckled at first, and then became silent as if the simple fact had deeply affected him. He had asked all my friends a few more questions about himself. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Wait. So they go through... Nurses began to ask us some very... So, easy questions, 1786. What do you guys think this image is? Because I, I, I don't, I can't figure that one out. 
And then this one's clearly George Washington and the cherry tree? Or George Washington and the apple tree? I don't know what this image is. Easy question about American history. Oh, wait. No, it's Abraham Lincoln. Because he's a different hat. Yeah, it's Lincoln. Lincoln, 1776, in a cherry tree. Until I told Mr. Rockefeller who I thought he was. He chuckled at first, and then became silent, as if the simple fact had deeply affected him. He had asked all my friends a few oh, more Jefferson questions instead about of himself. Washington. Yeah. And with each answer, he seemed a little more scared. Mr. Rockefeller quietly stood with the nurses for a while, before he wished us a Merry Christmas and blessed. That evening, the nurses took x-rays of us to make sure we hadn't broken our ribs. Usually, those taking the x-rays are more than happy to show their patients what the pictures look like. But when I asked to see them, the nurses ignored me. I didn't fall asleep that night. I kept my ear close to the wall to hear what the nurses were saying next door. I heard one sentence over and over. Everything's I wonder what they meant by that. I never told my friends, because I didn't want to scare them. But I spent the rest of the night with my hand to my chest, wondering if my heart was ever on the right side. Several weeks, the children were kept under observation at the Columbia Presbyterian Hospital. I visited them as soon as I had the chance to. All the families of these children were deeply unsettled, for they had all independently come to the conclusion their child had been replaced by a doppelganger. They claimed that these new sons and daughters possessed substantial differences from their real children. The majority of differences involved altered physical attributes and the inability to recognize familiar locations and characters, such as their parents and their homes. Two boys Archangel. claimed We're to diving have into monument mythos. to those that their mothers have given them at birth. But of all the discrepancies, the most bizarre was their faulty recollections of- Oh, wait. Oh, wait, chat. I just put something else together. This is the- th this is an image that they're using for John D. Rockefeller. This is an image of John D. Rockefeller. There's a- Pretty substantial difference here, actually. Uh, John D. Rockefeller had a mustache most most of his life, I believe. Although may maybe not. There are also images of him without a mustache. Uh, never mind. Never mind. False alarm. False alarm. All right. Of notable persons and events, for instance. Each of the affected children... No, bo both of them were John D. Rockefeller. It's just that John D. Rockefeller, usually in a lot of the pic pictures of him, had a mustache. ...claimed that I had become the wealthiest man in America through an oil monopoly. It is common knowledge that I did indeed work at an oil refinery in my youth. But to entirely deny my two terms as president and insist instead that I had always been a mere philanthropist struck me as being particularly odd. The family... So, the children said Rockefeller was a philanthropist and oil man. But Rockefeller here was president twice were agonized by the children's behavior. 
Some continue to search for their real children. I support their endeavors, for I do not believe that the children's afflictions were the results of hysteria. Every day, I find myself recollecting the day that I had selected the tree. I have since realized the difficulties involved in the removal of it should have repeatedly discouraged me. And had I been discouraged, the families of those children would not be experiencing the anguish that they currently have. Perhaps I never had the opportunity to select another tree. Perhaps I was meant to select that tree regardless of my persistent character. Perhaps we are all trolleys, forced to follow the path of the track to each of our destinations. I take solace in that thought. Or perhaps the tree chose me. God damn. <laughs> My father believed that the 1934 Christmas tree vanished. This is untrue. I have seen it wandering in the plaza on many occasions. And it resembles a man far more than any tree. John D. Rockefeller Jr. This is, this is something. That looks like one of the flash, that looks like one of the flashes from the Corner Folk video. Okay, we have two more left in the first season. We're only gonna go through the first season. My crazy canyon, can canyon adventure. <laughs> I saw something really weird. <laughs> Spoilers, Archangel. Then I saw it again.
what? Hey, yo. watching <laughs> from a series of exchanges from 1858 from Freedom Faller. Okay, Thomas U. Walter, architect, to Montgomery Meggs, um, engineer. Liberty must stand on the Capitol Dome. Yes, I will find an artist to bring the statue to life. Thomas Crawford, sculptor. Would you provide a design for the statue? Most certainly. Freedom 1, Freedom 2, Freedom 3. Freedom 3 will do, but change her cap. I'll remove the cap and begin to cast. Six weeks later. Freedom is difficult to cast. Apologies for delays. Three weeks later. Is Freedom on her way? Alfonso Zafina, detective. Inspector Zafina speaking. Mr. Crawford passed away. Monarca will receive freedom. Expect arrival in a month. Part 2. Daughter. Text and illustrations by Nina Crawford. Read by an Italian student in Gibraltar. Papa's sketches for freedom are beautiful. She looks like Mama if she was me. I asked Papa if he could make a statue that looks like me. He said yes. Papa went to his studio today. I asked whether he started working on my statue. Aw, Mr. Fings, thank you for subscribing. And for being subscribed for 26 goddamn months, you wonderful human you. Papa went to his studio today. I asked whether he started working on my statue yet, and he just kept smiling. I think he is. Papa is very kind. This is... I don't like this. We have not heard from Papa for a few days. This has happened before, since he likes to work in his studio for a long time. But Mama was very worried today. She left for his studio after she tucked me in bed. Mama returned home tonight. She went straight to her room. Inspector Zafino came by today. He asked us about Papa and then went to Mama's room. A few moments later, more men showed up. Mama was crying. She kept yelling. Inspector Zafino came by today. He asked us about Papa. Oh, God. It's going so fast.
Okay. A few moments later, more men showed up. Mama was crying. She kept yelling. She has his eyes. She has his eyes. I was scared. I ran out of the house. I remember Papa telling Mama about how the statue would be put on a ship named uh, Monarcha. I went to the docks and found her anchored nearby. Next to the ship were some boxes. Parts of freedom were in each of the boxes. I crawled into the box that was empty. I hope to be sent to where Papa is. I feel his spirit around freedom. I am very hungry. The boxes are tied with ropes, so I cannot get out myself. There's a loud noise in the room, like clay being dragged across the floor. I hear the ropes being cut and something big coming out of the box. Is it Papa? There are more sounds, like wood being broken. Since the ropes broke, I quickly got out of the box and found some bread and fruit in the room next door. And I am wrong. It isn't Papa, but it has his eyes. I'm scared of going into the box again. It made louder sounds yesterday. While I gathered food, I think the men saw me. The box is the only place to hide. The ropes keep being broken by the thing with Papa's eyes. I'm scared that... I'm scared that either it or the men will open my box. I'm scared that either it or the men will open my box. I will not write as much because I'm afraid of making noise. I will write again when I'm on land. The thing with Papa's eyes looked at me, took me today. It held me as it ran through the jungle. Its sword cut hundreds of trees. I could not see much in the dark, but I did see Papa's eyes staring down at me from those metal eyelids. I went down a hole and into a deep cave. After it led me down to the ground, it started a fire by hitting its arms against the rocks. It's been sharpening its sword on the rocks for hours now, but it has not ever looked down at its blade. Since I have started writing today, the thing with Papa's eyes has been looking at me. Part 3, Captain. Excerpts from the Captain's Log of the Monarcha. 6 crates were loaded at dawn. They are heavy. Each containing a part of a large sculpture, Inspector Zafino. What? Okay, Inspector Zafino told me that it is the goddess of freedom. Each crate was fastened with ropes in the storage room. No sliding. It's possible. We left uh, Livorno at noon. The 29th of April, we landed in Gibraltar at dawn. The ship took hours to steer into port. There were many, many holes in the storage room. Each one allowed enormous amounts of water to enter. Without the tar, we would have sunk in three days. C'erano molti, molti buchi neri postiglio. Ciascuno di essi ha permesso di non mi continuare ad acqua ad entrare. Senza il catrame saremmo affondati in tre giorni. We opened the crates for customs officers. The crates were empty. Gli ufficiali della dogana, le casse erano vuote. Part 4, Commissioner, written in red by Commissioner H. Morgan. On the morning of April 29th, we received numerous reports regarding a tremendous force that rushed up the rock which tore down hundreds of trees and created several landslides throughout the previous night. One civilian likened the phenomena to the work of a gigantic crazed fowler. Due to the sheer number of reports and the high level of concern in the surrounding community, I deployed myself along with 13 officers to the rock in search of an explanation. We discovered that there was indeed an English village trail through the dense foliage stretching almost the entire height of the rock. The trail was astonishingly linear, with no bends in the path. The cuts to the trees themselves were precise. The downed trees continued to be worn to the touch, presumably due to the extreme speed of this force. 
Kentucky file presence along the trail were extinguished by fellow officers as we traversed the rock. The path ended at a large crevice in the ground, which looked to be an entrance to a large underground cavern. After requesting additional men and equipment, Officer Hadley descended into the crevice. It was not long until Hadley exclaimed in fright and urged us all to enter. Within the following hour, the majority of us were in the cavern, which appeared to be an undiscovered offshoot of Sir Michael's cave. In the middle of the location stood a plaster model of a tall, Greco-Roman statue of a woman. Surrounding the sculpture were the splayed remains of an individual, flattened like a set of clothes. A hollowed-out torso was stretched a quarter of the way up the statue, the sight of which compelled a few of the officers to exit the cabin. The human remains were collected and sent to the morgue, while the sculpture was cleaned and lifted out. The statue's blade, held in its right hand, matched the cut present on the downed trees. Despite the fantastical implications of this detail, the Gibraltar Police Force officially concludes that the work of the crazed fella was nothing more than the result of heavy wind. <laughs> During a secondary investigation, a journal was discovered in the cabin. A translation of its Italian text is in progress. Part 5 Craftsman, Freedom, written by Philip Reed. Arrives the tight-knit wooden ship. The plaster body is absent. Instead, a tall, wounded woman, sleeping in its vessel, donning a helmet wrapped in a robe, clutching a sword and a damaged shield overheard a conversation with the captain, a violent conflict with freedom at the port in Gibraltar. They tell me inside her is the plaster, and I walk away, silently believing freedom craved liberation so terribly she tried to take it for herself. But off the ship, she was dragged away Freedom locked up. Freedom in chains. They tell me I have to take it out of her. So hook, rope, peel, and pull. When it was done, Freedom stood motionless. Freedom stood still. I see the final bronze woman, and I feel as if, maybe even hope, she's only dormant now, and will awaken again. Part 6, Sculpture Anti-Dean Association storms U.S. Capitol. Millions look on in horror during attack on democracy. The Statue of Freedom is shot down by ADA gunfire. Freedom Faller, filmed by Alex. 
Well, that was season one of the Monument Mythos. And honestly, I don't know what the fuck is going on in a lot of that. Um, I will say that I... Okay, here's, here's my theory, okay? I do have one theory. I think... Because, okay, I think there was something weird about James Dean's voice. I think James Dean someone pointed someone said AI voice. I think James Dean might be like a robot. So fucking awesome and scary. I think James Dean is a robot. He has a very robotic voice. And they made a comment about how he had very like human-like expressions or something along those lines. When no one else will, one immortal patriot remains to defend Dean Democracy. Yes. Hey, LB. May I post my theory? Go for it, Gamergy. Only theories from people who haven't seen this, by the way. Because I know that there are people who have watched ahead. What? Also, chat, if you have been enjoying the stream, uh, please hit the follow button over on Twitch. Hit the subscribe button on YouTube. Hit the like button on the stream and consider coming over to riverboat.gg and dropping some subs or donos because that will really help me to, to live. And I would like that very much. Jack just doesn't want to, me to chat since she knows I've seen like half of the YouTube spoops. You have. But I'm going to watch the, uh, I'm going to react to the, um, uh, the the Vita Vita Carnis or whatever it's called. Uh, I I know nothing about that. I'm going in blind uh, on Friday. If you can uh, unlock that one theory, the special trees are appendages of a massive subterranean creature. Maybe. May and that's why they're so hard to excavate. But if it was an appendage, you wouldn't be able to excavate them, right? Join us. James Dean died in a racing accident as president as he died from a car race in real life. That's why they keep mentioning the racing. He was replaced by a body double or possibly an entity created by the trees. Oh, they did talk about Washington possibly being replaced by a body double. <laughs> 